what is Jesus' relationship to the church today? And uh, does the Church of Christ have a headquarters? Uh, these are a few questions that are answered in Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, if you have a Bible with you this morning, I would encourage you to uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. The week before our last, I had the blessing of uh, beginning to uh, preach through this book, study through the first uh, chapter with you. And as we look at the end of chapter 1 this morning, there are two things that uh, are brought up here. First of all, Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus. And this is just the first prayer mentioned in this book. And as Paul prays, he uh, transitions to speak about uh, Jesus Christ and his authority. And when you look at this passage, I think it really uh, challenges us to comprehend what God has done through his son. And really what he continues to do through Jesus Christ. And so we are reminded in this passage that we have the blessing of prayer. And we can see how Paul prayed. I think he's a good example for us to follow regarding uh, prayer. And we also see in this chapter that we have the blessing of serving a righteous king. A king who is far above the uh, corruption and the wickedness which exists in this present world. A Lord who is loving and compassionate. If you ever take the time to read through Paul's letter to the uh, church at Ephesus, one of the uh, major themes in this epistle is Jesus' relationship uh, to the church. And uh, this is a theme that we find yet again at the end of, of the first chapter. And so I'd like us to begin here uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 15. And here we uh, read Paul's prayer, his prayer to those uh, at Ephesus. And uh, I'd just, just like to provide a, a short little outline regarding uh, the verses we'll look at. Hopefully this can help you track uh, where we're at as we go through this, uh, the end of this first chapter here. And so here we read about Paul's prayer, verses 15 through 19. And we see this is a prayer of thanksgiving. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, let's start verse 15. He says, Wherefore I also, after I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And so if we follow Paul's example of prayer, who should we pray for? You know, we should, of course, pray for all people. We should pray for those who have authority over us in this present world, those in the government. Uh, but we should pray specifically for our brothers and sisters in the faith. We should pray for one another. And uh, I think if we're going to really be effective in doing that, then we have to spend some time together. We have to get to know one another. You know, how can I pray for your needs if I don't know what your needs are? And uh, if you've been blessed, how can I be thankful and praise God for the blessings you've received in life if I don't know about the blessings you've uh, received? Now, of course, we can you know, just kind of say a generic prayer. You know, God, be with the church and be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But again, if we want to be a little bit more effective and more detailed in our prayers, then we have to uh, get to know one another. And we see here Paul praying not only for those at Ephesus, but a moment we'll see he prayed some specific things regarding the, uh, prayed for some specific things regarding the church uh, at Ephesus. And so we should get to know one another. Uh, just the basic, you know, us coming to church, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves to get, together as the manner of some is. You know, just us coming together and worshiping God, uh, that is one way we can get to know each other a little bit better. And of course, you know, when we come together, there's usually announcements. If someone's going through some kind of difficulty, uh, if someone has been blessed or if there's something exciting happening in their life, like they're getting married or something like that, that's usually announced as well. Uh, we have you know, the bulletin that will have a you know, list of, of people who are seeking and soliciting prayers. Uh, and so just coming to worship and, and partake, participating in what the church is doing, uh, that is a, a way we can get to know one another uh, and be effective in our, in our prayers. We are reminded here that prayer uh, is not just about worship to God. And uh, of course, it is that. Prayer is an act of worship. But we also see here that prayer is a way that we can serve one another in the faith. If we go back to verse 16, Paul said he, uh, he ceased not to give thanks 
uh, for the church at Ephesus, making mention of them in his, uh, in his prayers. And uh, this reminds me of what is said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where we're told to pray without ceasing. Now, does that mean we have to have uh, a prayer you know, going on in our heads 24-7? You know, no, I don't think that's what it means. Uh, I heard one man explain it this way you know, throughout his whole life. If you look at his life, he eats without ceasing. You know, because if we truly stopped eating, we would die. You know? So same thing regarding our, our spiritual life and our spiritual walk. When we look at our whole, our whole life and our whole walk with God, we ought to be a people who are characterized by prayer. That prayer is something we do continually, something we do regularly. And in that sense, we pray without uh, ceasing. Now, as we continue reading here, we can see some of these specifics uh, Paul prayed for. And uh, letter B there, we see that he prayed for wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. This is verses 17 through 19. And he continues saying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And so we see here he prayed for several things. First of all, if you look at verse uh, 17, uh, he prayed that God may give a spirit of wisdom and revelation to those at Ephesus. Uh, several things in verse 18. First of all, in verse 18, uh, he prayed that they have the eyes of their understanding enlightened. Perhaps your translation might say the eyes of your heart enlightened. Uh, also in verse 18, he says to know the hope of his calling. And also in verse 18, to know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then lastly, in verse 19, he prayed... Uh, that those at Ephesus could know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And so these are some wonderful things I think we should pray for today. And uh, if you're ever you know, wondering, hey, what should I pray for? If you're struggling with you know, what to go to God, uh, what, to, what to take to God in prayer, uh, this is a great passage to turn to. <coughs> You know, what does having the eyes of your understanding enlightened mean uh, in verse 18? Uh, the American Standard Version says having the eyes of your heart enlightened. And in the biblical context, the, the heart, the human heart, it's not talking about, you know, the muscle, the, the blood pumper. You know, that's really all the physical heart does. It just pumps our blood. It's just a muscle. But it's talking about our mind. In the Bible, the heart is the seat of our thoughts and our desires, our affections. And uh, I think we have a good uh, commentary on this verse uh, in the book of Acts. In uh, Acts 26, verse 18, these are Jesus' words to the Apostle Paul regarding his, uh, his ministry and what the, Paul, uh, what the Apostle Paul was to do. And it says, uh, Jesus speaking to him says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so to have the eyes of our understanding enlightened or the eyes of our heart enlightened means that we learn the gospel and we learn it in such a way that we're able to respond to it so that through the power of Christ and through the power of God, we can turn away from darkness. We can turn away from the power of Satan and turn to the power of God and have forgiveness and have an inheritance uh, among those uh, who believe in Christ. You know, that's why the, gospel, the word gospel means good news. And for those who believe in the gospel, it's, it's freedom. It's freedom and blessings in God. And so a lot of what passes today for enlightenment really has nothing to do with the gospel, has nothing to do with God. A lot of this new age, spiritualism, enlightenment type stuff which is in vogue today really is satanic and does nothing to remedy the sin which exists in the world. 
You know, true enlightenment is receiving and understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And continuing with this theme, if we go back to Ephesians, it says in chapter 5, verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness. And so here's, you know, a humbling verse that we should think about. You know, we shouldn't think too highly of ourselves, think we're, you know, better than other individuals. At one point in time, we were all lost. We all needed salvation. We all need the blood of Christ. And he continues, he continues here, he says, You were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And so because we have received the gospel, because we have believed in it and obeyed it and allowed it to reveal and open the eyes of our heart that we can respond to it, uh, we are now light in the Lord and we are encouraged to walk as, as children of light. You know, we have to be careful and we have to remember that the devil is at work in this world today. And if the eyes of our understanding are not being enlightened by the Word of God, then we are being blinded by the false religion and false philosophies which are so uh, rampant in our culture today. And you just, you know, just think about what's on television today. You know, any kind of modern, almost any modern day sitcom, for example, it's going to have people living together who aren't married. It's going to have a celebration of homosexuality and drinking and drugs and so on. And that's, that passes for entertainment in our country. And there's people who don't care about the Bible, who push the scriptures aside. And even though it's just entertainment and it's just fiction, that is what people are absorbing in their minds. Hours and hours a day, they are absorbing that into their minds. You know, we have to be careful about the kinds of things we invite into our lives, the kinds of philosophies, the kinds of ideas that we find uh, entertainment in, and the kinds of things that we allow our, our children to view. And so if our eyes aren't being enlightened, if the eyes of our understanding are not being enlightened by the gospel, you know, be certain that the world is working to blind you and blind people from seeing the truth of, of God's word. One of the things Paul prayed for is hope. As we go back to Ephesians 1 verse 18, he prayed for the eyes of uh, those at Ephesus, he prayed for the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. Then he says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. To know the hope of his calling. And the word hope here doesn't mean wish. I think we kind of use the word that way sometimes. Well, I hope this happens. You know, I hope I can go here or do that. And we say kind of a sense of, I wish this would happen. Uh, but that's not the meaning of the word here. The meaning of the word hope here uh, is a confident <laughs> expectation. And so we are to have an expectation uh, regarding our faith in God. Uh, an expectation regarding what God is calling us to. What is God calling us to? What is He inviting you to? If we go to Ephesians 4, verse 4, it says, You are called in one hope of your calling. And so ultimately, there's one great expectation, there's one hope that we have in the faith. Let's go to chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy for His great love or with He loved us, even when we were dead in sin, <coughs> hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. You know, ultimately that's the hope that we, we have, the hope of salvation. And uh, I think it's interesting if you look at verse 6, how he speaks about us being raised together with Christ, having seated us together with Christ in heavenly places. He speaks as if that's already happened. That we are already united with Christ. And in a certain sense, we are already citizens of His heavenly kingdom. We sit with Him in the heavenly uh, kingdom. Now that is the hope that we have. Salvation. Our inheritance. That when Christ returns, He's returning to this world to take his people home, to take the citizens of his kingdom home. And so Paul prays that we should, we should know that and have confidence in that as, as Christians. Now as we keep reading here, he transitions, and it's, it's pretty smooth the way he transitions uh, from his prayer to 
uh, speaking about Jesus' uh, authority. He transitions from his prayer to, to Jesus' authority. Again, just a quick uh, uh, short outline to help you kind of keep track of, of where we're going here. As we continue reading in verses uh, 19 and following, he speaks about the authority of Christ. And he mentions several things. First of all, he mentions the resurrection. Then he speaks about how Christ is above all things. And then related to that is, is all things are subject or all things are under uh, Christ. And so if we back up to verse 19, as he's, he's, he's in the middle of this prayer, coming to the end of this prayer, I should say. If you go to verse 19, he says he wants us to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power uh, toward us who believe. And notice he says, according to the working of his mighty power, and this is where he transitions, he says in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And if we think about God's power, and specifically God's power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, did that power mean that when Jesus lived in this world that he was free of troubles, that he was free of of suffering and free of uh, negativity from others. You know, it, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean at the appointed time, by the mi uh, mighty power of God, Jesus was resurrected. And not only was he raised from the dead, but he was raised above all the uh, authority that exists in this, this world. And so being raised, he was also vindicated. You know, think about the, the kangaroo court that the Jewish people put him through, you know, basically telling lies, uh, giving false testimony to the things he was saying and things he was doing. Uh, they beat him. They uh, scourged him. They made a mockery of him. Uh, they, they reviled him and said horrible things to him while he was being crucified. And yet after all that, God raised him from the dead. It shows God vindicated Jesus Christ. You know, what, what could anyone say to that? You know, after everything, all the horrible things they had done, God raised them from the dead. You can't, you can't argue with that. Now, those who opposed Christ back then and those who oppose Christ today, they're still going to say whatever they want. They're still going to revile Christ. But it doesn't change the fact that God has raised him, raised him from the dead and raised him above everything that is in this world. And so what does that mean for you uh, in your life and in your walk with God? You know, when you go through difficulties, uh, when someone is extremely uh, negative to you or if you're going through some kind of hardship, does that mean God is just going to instantly snap his fingers and make it all go away? You know, typically that's not how, how it works. But we can have that, again, that hope, that confidence that a day is coming, that there's a point in time coming where God is going to raise us up just as he raised Jesus up and in that same sense, we're also going to be vindicated. Vindicated in our beliefs. Vindicated in our, our faith in Christ. And if God raises you up, well then who can take you down? You know, who can pull you down? It's not going to happen. And so not only did God resurrect Jesus Christ, but He also is going to resurrect us. And that's part of the prayer. That's why He transitions. He says we ought to know in verse uh, 19... Uh, the power of God that works in our lives and that is going to work in our lives. And we can know that power by the power of God the Father to raise Jesus uh, from the dead. And so not only did He raise Him from the dead, if you look at verse 21, He raised Christ above everything. Going to verse 21, speaking about Christ, it says uh, He is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, in the ancient world, to, to be at someone's right hand, especially someone like a prince or someone in a position of authority, that was a great place of honor. And it was also a position of, of authority. And so here we read that Jesus has been raised to the right hand of God the Father. That he is in heaven, and he's at God's right hand, and what is he doing there? You know, what's implied in this, this passage? Look at verse 21. It says he's far above all principality and power. 
Also, verse 22 says all things are under his feet. And so it's a picture of Christ reigning as a king, ruling uh, over this world. This is uh, said in Revelation 19, 16 about Christ. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, it doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who the king of some foreign nation is. Christ is above that individual. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord over Lords. And so Jesus Christ is not only our authority, but He's the uh, authority for the entire world. He alone is the only begotten Son of God. He alone is the one who died for our sins and could die for our sins. He is uh, the one that God raised from the dead and raised above all principality and power and put all things under His feet. You know, in my life I've encountered people who claim that they are Christians. They claim they are followers of Jesus Christ. However, as I got to know them, it became uh, extremely evident that they did not believe in Jesus' authority. And that there were significant portions of the New Testament that they did not believe either. You know, if we look at Ephesians chapter 1 and consider carefully what's being said in verses uh, 21 and following, if this was the only passage in the New Testament which spoke about Christ's authority, I think it would be, you know, it would be enough. You know, it talks about Him being above everything. If we go back to verse uh, 21, it says, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And so very clearly, this is telling us Christ has all authority. His authority uh, is universal. However, this doctrine is not just found in this one passage. You know, as with you know, a lot of fundamental or important teachings, it's something that's spread uh, throughout all the Bible. You know, the same, this, virtually the same uh, statement in Ephesians, Jesus said the same thing. Uh, during the Great Commission, after his death, burial, and resurrection, as he is speaking to the apostles and uh, commissioning them to go out of the world, to make disciples of all nations. As, uh, he said in uh, 28, verse 18, uh, he came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And the word power here means power in the sense of authority. That he has all authority, not only in, in heaven, in the spiritual realm, but also here in this world, in earth. And I humbly ask you this morning, do you believe that statement? Do you believe Jesus' words? I do. And I believe he has all authority in this world, in this earth. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, speaking about Christ, it says, Who's gone into heaven, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. And so here we learn that the uh, uh, things that are spiritual in nature, angels, for example, uh, are subject to Christ. And I think uh, a lot of people who, uh, who read the Bible or know a little bit about the Bible think that uh, you know, there's a kind of a dichotomy between God and, and Satan, that uh, these are kind of two equal figures who are fighting for uh, our affections and, and so forth. And uh, Satan is fighting for our affections in this world, but he is not equal with God in any way. Uh, he is not equal with Christ in any way. Uh, he is a spiritual being. He's a created being. And he is subject to, to God, just like every uh, creature is subject to the authority of God. And so we see that here in, in Peter, that all the spiritual realm, uh, angels, authorities, powers, they are subject uh, unto him. Uh, the one more passage regarding this, Philippians 2, 9 and 10, says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So again, things uh, in heaven, things under the earth, that would be the spiritual world, the spiritual realm. But also mentions things in earth, that would be us, uh, human beings, this world today. We all need to bow before Jesus Christ. And so we can see from these, these verses that Jesus' authority is universal. That God has raised him far above 
all principality and power, everything uh, in this present world. And if we go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and read the rest of the chapter, verses 22 and 23, it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so not only does Christ have authority over everything, but especially in the church, we need to recognize uh, his authority, his, his headship. He is head over all things to the church. Uh, there, uh, it says there in verse uh, 22. Now, does the church of Christ have a headquarters? Now, if you look at a lot of uh, churches today, they have a, a worldly uh, headquarters. You know, usually in some state, there's actually a group of people where they meet together and they, they kind of dictate what's going to happen in the church that year, what the church is going to believe, what they're going to practice, uh, and so on. Uh, well, in the church of Christ, we do not elect men to form a government in the church. Uh, which there are, you know, boards and superintendents and officials and so on and so on and so on. Uh, there is not, you know, one person or one group of people here on earth uh, which dictate what we're going to believe or what we're going to practice uh, in the church. But with that said, we do have a headquarters, and that headquarters is heaven. You know, Christ is called our head. Verse 22, he is head over all things to the church. And we learn in this verse that he is above this world. He's at the right hand of God. His quarters, his dwelling place, is in heaven at God's right hand, God the Father's right hand. And so the headquarters for the church uh, is in heaven. We are given this uh, warning and this admonition in Colossians 2, verses 18 and 19. It says, Let no man beguile you, of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And notice it says at the very beginning of verse 19, and not holding the head. You know, that's a reference to Christ. He is our head. He is the one we have to hold fast to. He is the one we must look to in the church. It says, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment minister and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. And so here, the church is pictured as a body, right? A physical body, a human body. And Jesus is the head of that body. And he says it's, it's through our head, that, through Christ, that the whole body really consists. We're all held together and nourished through uh, the head. Obviously, you don't want to separate your head from the body, right? You know, then that's not going to be good for, for your health at all. So, you know, there, there are times, I think, where as, as Christians, we need to be iconoclasts. That is to say that we need to tear down and destroy false images and false ideas that people set up for themselves. And there's a lot of people who claim to be followers of Christ, but they do not really recognize Christ as the head of the church. They recognize some person or some uh, group of people as the uh, authority. Now, why should we be iconoclasts? Now, should we do that because we want to be mean and uh, pretend like we're better than other people and that we're holier than other people? No. You know, sometimes we need to tear things down if we really want to uh, serve God correctly. When God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, for example, he said in Jeremiah 1 verse 10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Notice he says, to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. And then he says, after all those words for destruction and tearing down, then he says, to build and to plant. And so for the word of God to be effective in a person's life, sometimes we have to do what Jeremiah was told to do. That we have to root out and pull down and destroy the false idols they have set up for themselves, set up in their heart. And if we don't deal with those issues, they're never really going to follow Jesus Christ as the authority uh, in their life. 
And only when we purify ourselves and, and get rid of all the worldly junk we have in our lives can we really begin to follow Christ and really begin to build and plant what God wants us to build and plant in our lives. You know, there's many people today who think they are following Jesus, but the reality is they're not. They're following the words of some, some man. And uh, I'd be quick to say, you know, anything you, you hear me say from the pulpit or in a Bible class, don't just take it for granted. You know, don't believe something because the preacher says it. You know, believe it because you're convicted of it from, from the Bible, uh, from, from God's Word. And so one of the fundamental principles of enlightenment uh, is recognizing the authority of Jesus Christ, which, of course, includes the authority of the New Testament. Because if we want to learn the words of Christ today, if we want to follow Christ today, this is how we get to know Him. This is how we learn His, his teachings and His doctrines. It's through uh, the New Testament. And so not only is He above all things, and He is the authority we must look to, uh, but we also learn that Jesus Christ, uh, all things are subject to Him. All things are subject to Christ. Verses uh, 22 uh, and 23. And uh, we've already read those. It says at the, the end of verse 22 that He is the head over all things to the church, which is His body. And so once again, the, the church is pictured as a body. And Jesus is the head of that body. And the church is, uh, is the rest. We are His body. And if you look at verse 23, what is the fullness of Christ mentioned in verse 23? Which is His body... The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. Here the church is pictured as the fullness uh, of Christ. The church is Christ's body. And if people are going to see the glory of Jesus today, it's going to be seen here. You know, if they're in this community, in this location, it's going to be seen in the church of Christ. All those in our community who are lost in sin, who are, who are struggling in life because they don't have God, who is going to save them? Who is going to turn their life around? Who is going to share the gospel with them, the truth with them? You know, Christ, of course, is the one who's going to save them, but it's going to be you and me who point them to that truth. Now, unless they're reading the Bible on their own and they... They come to that. There's, there's actually been a few people I've met who have converted themselves. Very few, but I have met a few. People who've converted themselves through studying the New Testament and beginning to go to, to churches and seeking and trying to find a church which actually teaches what the Bible says. I uh, actually went uh, to school with a man who, that's how he was converted. He began just reading and eventually ended up at a church of Christ and uh, began asking a lot of questions about, about the Bible. Uh, but that's, I think, a, kind of a rare thing. So unless that, hap unless that happens, the only way someone's going to learn the truth today is through you and me or through some other faithful member of the uh, church of Christ. If we do not take the gospel out to our community, no one else is going to do it for us. And you know, I've heard people say that uh, in my life. I've heard preachers say that. And... Uh, Rather recently, in the past few years, that's, that's really been affirmed, and I've seen that in my life. If we do not take the gospel out to those in the community, no one else is going to do it. No other church is going to do it. You know, do you think Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are out there knocking on people's doors and striving to share the gospel with people? That's not what they're doing. Do you think some denomination which is steeped in creeds and confessions and teaching for doctrines the commands of men, do you think they're out there trying to share the purity of God's Word and share the Gospel exactly as it is, presenting it from the New Testament? They're not doing it. They're not going to do it. If we are out there striving to influence people and share the Gospel with them, no one else in this world is going to do it for us. If we will not take the Gospel out to our community, there is no other. And if people want to know the fullness of Christ today, if they want to learn about Jesus and learn the truth, they're going to find it in the church. They're going to find it in His, His body. And if we are faithful to Him, if we've been baptized in, into Christ, then we are a part of His body. And we can share those blessings uh, with others. And so as we look at this passage, we are reminded of the, the blessing of prayer. 
And we do have that amazing blessing that really any time we want, we can go to the creator of the universe and beseech him in prayer. And he hears our prayers and he answers our prayers according to his will. In this passage we've been looking at this morning, we also learn uh, that we should pray for uh, one another specifically. And we ought to uh, uh, pray for things that are happening in, in the church. That we can grow and that we can comprehend the profound blessings of God through his, uh, through his Son. And then we also are reminded of Christ's authority. Not only His authority in the uh, entire world, over the entire earth, but also His authority uh, in the church. There are some people, I think, in the world today who like the idea of Jesus to some extent, but for whatever reason, perhaps they've uh, had some kind of bad experience in their life, they don't like the idea of, of a church or going uh, to church. And, uh, you know, I can somewhat sympathize with that if someone's had some kind of bad experience. But we have to remember the church is the body of, of Christ. And if a person believes that they can be saved and perpetually forsake the assembly, forsake coming to church, then they believe in something other than what the New Testament says. You know, whether they know it or not, if, if someone says they're all about Jesus, but they're not about religion or not about church, they're trying to separate the head from the body. You know, Jesus is the head over all things to the church. The church is his body. And the church is where the fullness of Christ is seen today. And so not only do we look, at, uh, look to Jesus for our authority and that we cherish him and, and highly respect him and strive to follow him, but also we need to consider one another and uh, cherish one another. We are called the family of God. You know, if we look at this, this letter, that's one of the blessings we have as, as uh, uh, those who have uh, believed and, and obeyed the gospel. We are adopted in the family uh, of God. We become a part of Christ's body. And it says in Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body. And also in Ephesians 5, 23, that Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body. Now, if there is one body and the church is the body, how many churches are there ultimately? There's ultimately one church, and it's the one Jesus promised to build. And either we are a part of his church, and we are a part of that body, or we are outside of it. I mean, there's no, there's no middle ground. And Jesus is only concerned with saving his body, his one body. So if we want salvation, we have to be a part of what Christ established. We have to be members of his body. And so this morning, if you desire to be added to that one body, the New Testament is very clear on what a person who is outside that body, who has never properly responded to the gospel, what they need to do to be a part of what Christ has, has promised and what he has uh, established. That person needs to hear and believe the gospel. They have to be willing to repent of their sins and confess their faith in Christ. And then lastly, be baptized for the remission of sins. Be baptized, be immersed into his body, and then continue in the faith. Continue to live a godly life. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. We are all one in the body of Christ. And for that we can thank God and bless God. And so this morning if you would like to put Christ on a baptism. And if we could uh, encourage you in any other way. If we could offer prayers for you. Then please let us know by uh, coming forward as we stand and as we sing.